Hello everyone and welcome to the Medavance webinar series hosted by Medavance Billing Service. Today's webinar is the importance of KPIs and revenue cycle management. We have a great presentation in store for you, but before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Now we have taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined this presentation using listening on your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Now we have put all lines on mute to reduce any background noise. If you have any concerns with audio or visual, please message me through the chat, win the chat room window located to the right of your screen. Now you will also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now you will be receiving a link to review the recorded webinar in two to three days. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. William McCormick. Bill, he's the CEO of Medavance Billing Service. Well, thank you very much, Lakeisha, and thanks to uh, all of you who have joined us in your designated places to um, get some general information on the, the importance of key performance indicators in the treatment circle today. Um, the presentation I've prepared today is a basic basic a presentation to give you some insights on things that we know are happening or in the industry and we want to make you aware of it so you can better manage your operation. As you know, most organizations track revenue cycle uh, performances through a variety of just basic billing and collection metrics. What we're going to do today is uh, go over a few of them to ensure that you are tracking and using them to better manage your facility. We know that in order for us to move as a collective body in this space, we're going to have to all work together to ensure that the, those that are individuals seeking sobriety have a place to go. And once they come and become uh, active patients in your facilities, that you're actually getting paid for the work that you do. And part of that is we want to understand what revenue cycle management is and what does it really mean in the process of dealing with the various challenges today uh, with the various payers. It's more than just the building and collection activity. It also includes, in our opinion, uh, the processes and procedures that help you understand even the forecasting of your revenue so that you can engage and then have a very good pathway to success for your organization. The key performance indicators, as you know, it measures a certain value or it demonstrates the effectiveness of you know, what you're doing in your operation. We can kind of correlated to the speedometer on our, in our cars or either the football game score clock um, at a football game because it will be hard to know how fast you're going or how much gas you have if you didn't have those indicators to tell you or if you're playing the game and you don't know how many seconds are left so you can decide what play to run. A key performance indicator works just that way uh, in the business world, understanding what is happening, what should be happening, and how can we prevent things or you know celebrate the things that we do do right. We also know that with the shrinking mar margins today, uh, along with the abundance of requests for uh, proof of medical necessity, it's going to be very important that we have data to drive us to a place where we can better understand what we're doing. So the question is, why do we use these KPIs? And the key performance indicator tells us a lot about what we're doing as an organization, not just a baseline of information about building and collection, but also about productivity with our staff. We're talking about denial patterns. We're talking about days it takes us to build our work. All these things identify these manageable trends that we know that if we set a great benchmark against what we're trying to accomplish, we have a better way to uh, see if we're meeting that mark, and if we're not meeting that mark, how can we take these metrics and help us become much better at it? So um, in, in this space, we're treating clients, and most of them are going through a set protocol of time. Uh, it's important to know how long from the time you treat the client until how long you get paid or how long do you actually submit billing to ensure that you're going to be uh, paid on time or paid at all. So one good indicator that we think is very important, we call it the bill charge lag time. 
and it's the time between when you actually provide the treatment, which is the date of service, and when you actually build the service out to the insurance company to be paid. We have several facilities across the country who find it easier to bill daily and a lot to bill once a week or some or other intervals. But the sooner you treat a client and the sooner that you get your bill in, you want to be able to make sure you have some kind of metric to track how long do that really take. If you bill it once a week and um, you're getting paid greater than three weeks, then your lag time is definitely going to be much higher. So it's important that you understand that once you render the service, can you really um, set up a protocol to build you know, as fast as you can to make sure you have all your claims submitted. So if you're not tracking the bill charge lag time metric in your organization, then you probably have a lot of money sitting on your side that's unsubmitted or unadjudicated and not at the payer so they can process to get your payment. So we want you to really think about the initial part of it is the service has been rendered. And if it's been rendered, then you definitely need to make sure that you're getting paid as timely as possible. And of course, the insurance company can't pay you if the uh, claim is not there on file. But in submitting the claim, we want to make sure that it's clean as well. Uh, and, and what we define clean claim as is the, the claim coming through from the building system to the clearinghouse that gets to the pair. And the less errors on that claim, the sooner it will pay because it will pass on the first time. Uh, currently, we have a four filter system to make sure that when the claims go, we just don't take the placeholders of data. But we have other line items to make sure that they have the proper information so that when it gets to the clearinghouse, it is actually connecting to the payer to pay on the first time. And of course, if you um, have clean claims rate, you treat the client on Tuesday, you put all the proper information in on Tuesday, you submit the claim for payment on Tuesday, then it should be received definitely by Wednesday morning um, at the payer so the payer can now have its system um, generate the activity for processing the claim so the payment can be part of the next cycle of pay. And that's very important, too, because if you have uh, work done earlier in the week and you have three or four passes to get the claim clean, then that tells us a lot of, of patterns of how do we enter data, are we taking the right information, or are people taking their time to put the proper information in, or do we want to use some technology now that we can scan a driver licenses or other ID cards so that it retrieves the information versus inputting. We do know that the number one error of all claims come from the general input in the intake area where there's information that is um, incomplete or information that is just absolutely uh, left out and voided. So if you want to have the clean claim process and you want to make sure that the metrics of monitoring this will tell you what the problem is. Uh, we do know claims can use placeholders. We can put dates of birth. And, uh, we can put names. We can put ID numbers. Uh, and it will meet the specification for the actual file size. So once it's adjudicated, then it will pass through. But the filters should be able to identify if the ID number is incorrect or the date of birth is incorrect because it's, it's correlating against the portals in the, the various uh, pair system to know that is um, Jane Doe is um, being treated. The, the date of birth is actually January 1st, 1955, and not January 15th, 1955. So those are some of the things you want to definitely monitor and ensure that you got the clean claims in and you can be able to monitor that using the clean claim rate matrix. Uh, in addition, if claims go in and then everything processes properly, what happens when they deny? Are we tr tracking the denials? What's causing the denials? Or is, is it denied because the policy has expired? Is it denied because the procedure code is wrong? Is it denied because there's a reason um, that does not meet the standard of payment based on the benefits that the clients have. So that metrics help guide the uh, facility to understand the percentage of claim denied by insurance companies, but also what's the formula to fix them so we'll be able to track how long it takes to fix a denial rate. Is it denied and then we appeal it? Are we tracking the appeal process? All these metrics help you better understand and manage uh, the operation because if you're not doing that, then um, it's been recorded that a lot of denied claims go unchallenged or unreadjudicated. Therefore, there's work being done and there's no payment being received, and people continue to do that. So I encourage that the denial rate ratio or the denial rate KPI is giving you 
um, the, you know, the baseline of information, but the formula is there to make sure we know where to track what the problem is of denial. There's always going to be front-end denials, and then if you have an outside source, there will be back-end denials because some of the information on the front-end will be put in by staff, and then information on the back-end of the adjudication and tracking will be coming from the actual provider of services if, like, there's a third-party vendor. And then um, days revenue outstanding, the DRO, as we call it, uh, tells you the number of days um, that are um, uh, remaining that it takes for claims to get paid. Uh, and you want to make sure that you use this because um, if you submit clean claims, you get everything in, and if you get it in and you don't get paid, then how much, how long are you going to wait to challenge the insurance company that you've been unpaid? And in the number of days that where the money is owed to you and not paid is a problem with cash flow in your system or in your organization. You have to get paid, and you want to be paid properly. There's some states who have prompt payment. Uh, statutes that require carriers to pay you on a claim in a certain number of days. So you want to be able to definitely calculate how soon it takes you to get paid. And if you start uh, tracking those through KPIs, knowing that which carrier takes the longest to pay you, then you can use that data to offset marketing activity or just being able to know what the census is for, that, for those carriers. It's very important to use this data to help you because a lot of facilities are paying a tremendous amount of money in marketing and outreach to try to get clients to choose their facility and their program for treatment. And then um, you provide the service and then it takes that long to get paid and you continue to market that same delayed, we call it delayed payment uh, spectrum. You don't want to be in that spectrum where all the carriers are going to pay you in 49 days and there's other carriers that we know pay between nine days, sometimes uh, you know from nine to you know four to five days. If you're waiting greater than that, then that's a problem and if you're not tracking to know that problem, um, then sooner or later the bank account will you know, be an indicator to say that there's no money. So greater than 90 days, any money outside of 90 days, there's a problem with that claim. And if you're not tracking to figure out what that problem is, and most times it's going to be related to medical records review uh, or being able to verify coordination of benefits uh, just to make sure that if a client had coverage and then they changed coverage and you just don't have the updated version of the updated um, policy information, the net would definitely delay your days of outstanding AR. Uh, let me get to the next slide here. Okay, the accounts receivable agent. This is the monthly report that every facility should receive. If you're not receiving uh, AR, and it should you should be able to get the summary and the detail. Uh, you should be able to track it from payers, pay, uh, patients, uh, and as well as procedures, because you want to know the breakdown of where your money is that has not paid. And most times if your uh, percentage greater than um, 90 days is double digit, meaning 10% and higher, um, you're going to have some cash flow issues, particularly if it's not related to a medical record request or some coordination benefits um, setback. Um, so make sure that if you are, uh, are watching your aging, uh, the bulk of your money should always be in your current, in your zero to 30 days. Uh, because that is your you know, current um, levels of activity. Um, and then rollovers should only roll over based on the date that it actually was adjudicated. Of course, if you're getting paid every 16 days, any claim after the 15th probably won't pay in the same month. So you will be able to know from your current that the money rolled over to the next um, cycle of, of, of aging should match that value. And if it's not matching that value, you want to make sure you do analysis to figure out why those claims are not paying and for those claims that did pay, to make sure they're paying at, at the proper uh, proper value. And most facilities today, uh, we see a lot of this where they're confused about the uh, collection rate gross and net. Uh, a lot of times they um, will have high bill charges, not understanding that it doesn't matter the value that you build, uh, it's the value that the benefits of the clients that their policy is going to cover. But what you do, you want to track to see if you're particularly out of network provider, the, um, the law requires you the ability to go after any funding um, that is not paid based on um, the out-of-network agreement because clients understand that if you charge $1,000 and their carrier pay $900, they are responsible for the $100. In addition to their uh, co-pay deductible or any out-of-pocket expenses, they still will be responsible. So if you're going to have a high bill charge 
um, then if your clients are understanding that they will be responsible for that value, um, you want to make sure that you have something in place or process in place to be able to um, send that bill into them so they will be able to uh, submit back payment to you. Or you want to be able to track to the know what is your gross collection and then what is your net collection. Um, a lot of times the carriers will uh, make payment and sometimes they don't pay to the level of benefits. So what are you doing and, and what do you have in place to uh, quantify that if the benefit pays 80% of reasonable and customary, the question is how do you determine the reasonable and customary? And the good way to do with the metrics is check some of your OELBs and track them to know what are you getting paid on average. So if that's the same parameters of payment, you then you're in the right uh, or gauge line. If not, then they pay that at an improper rate. You definitely can challenge those. We do a lot of that. Uh, we find that a lot of policies, they state certain benefits, but they don't pay at that benefit. And then you want to be able to definitely calculate that to you know, better understand uh, that you're being paid to the benefit level of the client. And that is part of what we uh, try to convey, that most times uh, facilities and owners don't understand. You are absolutely entitled to exactly what the benefits of that client policy states. And, and that's all we fight for. We fight for because that's what you're entitled to. Uh, and most times people give in on that fight because they think uh, if they pay 80% of a charge and you receive 80%, then it's okay. But you're entitled to 100% of the 80% benefit, and you should definitely not leave it on the table for them to record as uncollectible revenue, and then they get to keep it, and you basically give up the variance of that, of that value. Um, I always go through what I call some simple reports, uh, reports just to kind of help you understand if you're not getting them on a monthly basis or you're not tracking them on a monthly basis, you need to start. And I want to go through a series of them and explain what they are. And there may be different names or on your side, but it all means the same at the end of the day if you have the, 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 the clarification of what, what those reports are, should be on your desk at the end of, of, of every month. Uh, the first thing is um, you want to be able to make sure that you're tracking this either monthly or you want to be able to scale it year to year so you can make sure you can see trends of performance and making sure it's matching your profitability. And if it's not, then you want to make sure that you use some kind of gauge to uh, ensure that you're tracking it month to month and then you can put some corrective actions in place. But you always want to know how much revenue you're making by pair. Uh, a lot of facilities today are paying a lot of money to market certain plans, but that plan they're spending more money in marketing than what their plan generates in revenue. And then, so if you don't have a revenue by pair or report, then you should definitely um, ask for one to make sure you have it. Uh, likewise, with the revenue by level of care or by procedure, if you are a multi-level, um, multi-service uh, provider uh, doing multiple levels of care, you want to know what level of care is generating what value to you under what procedure. And if you are not tracking that, is then you're definitely not knowing. You can be offering a bundle service under uh, IOP where you're adding other ancillary services, but when you look at what you reimburse and what it costs for you to perform that bundle, you actually could be losing money uh, because you didn't track to know what was the revenue being generated by, by that level of care. An accounts receivable agent, the monthly, I think is uh, definitely uh, what I call the, the highlight report every month. You want to know exactly what money is left out there uh, that's unpaid. You want to know by payer. You should also drill it down if you want to see what patients haven't paid and then also what procedures are not paying. Uh, a lot of times we just look at the dollar value as a gross number and it could be $100,000 still in a you know 60-day bucket, but what does the $100,000 make up? Or is it the same offender? Is it the same carrier who's dragging out paying you? These are indicators that you can use by having certain metrics to uh, basically guide you through uh, understanding the fiscal side of your, of, of your revenue. And then the revenue by collective versus collectible. There are times when um, if the benefit has uh, been stated that it pays X and then you are still trying to co collect Y, then you're chasing Y and it's never going to pay. So that's uncollectible. So you want to make sure that the collectible value always stays on the table, that you're always pursuing it. And if it's not a collectible value, then you should take it off your 
your agent and then not anticipate getting paid on something when the benefits have clearly stated that these are the benefits levels and that's what it pays at. And if you've exhausted that, then there's no more energy. I think you should be pressing on something that's uncollectible. So you want to make make sure that there's energy going after what is you know what is collectible. And when you know what's collected, you want to be able to gauge to see that it is matching the benefits of the clients. And you can do that. There's a great way to do that uh, with metrics is so you can um, better understand that the revenue that you put out is definitely revenue, uh, but based on services that you have been paying for, are you entitled to get paid for, and it should be uh, sought off to the last possible venture to get paid. I mentioned earlier the denial rate report that you want to know why things are denying. We create denial codes so we can learn patterns of why they're denying certain things. Uh, and you want to make sure there's patterns that you can educate and retrain staff on. You can use that metric systems to do that. Or if there's errors on the side of, uh, we use it. So if we have a, 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 a collector or a biller who is not performing at, at peak performance, we'll be able to know because we can look at the denial report reason. If there's something that they have not performed uh, and things that they've been trained on, we're able to kind of in, um, engage them immediately to see um, that the, the reason this is being denied is because of error of work performance. Uh, most times, the denial rates is going to uh, impede on uh, not having no authorization for services or that this coverage has terminated in some fashion, other than the denying of medical records necessities, or they've read records and find that they still uh, does not meet a standard of care, so they will reimburse them. But we still want to track any other denials other than the three main ones. You want to track all of them to see what is creating the denial, and if those denials are happening on a pattern base, then what intervention that needs to take place to fix them. And probably the largest report that ever is generated a month is called the Detailed Transaction Report. The detailed transaction report should be able to give you a definitive bird's eye view of every single thing happened to that account or your account by line throughout the entire month of activity. Whatever happened, if it was if it was billed, if it was paid, if it was denied, if it was reversed and paid again, if it was appealed, all the activity of that claim, you're able to see uh, the detail level so that now that shows that what is really being done. If you have you know, 35 clients and your billing is $2 million a month, and you look at your detailed transaction and there are days that are unbilled, you will be able to know. You'll be able to immediately know that we normally bill $2 million, we're at 1.4. So there's $600,000 that have not been billed. And you'll be able to find out which one has not been billed because it will give you the detailed line item information for each and every single uh, transaction based on each patient. So this is um, the big report that the equity companies love to receive because they can drill down, they can put this data in, in, in different formats and then filter them to be able to kind of give them a very forecast view. Uh, in conjunction with the next report, the claims waterfall report, which is the report that should tell you um, how long do it take that claim to pay its full value. If the value is $1,000, how long did it take them to pay you the entire $1,000? Did it come on the first run, which is 11 days, 19 days, 38 days, 40 days? Or they paid you you know, half on the first cycle and half on the second cycle? The waterfall report shows that claim, so it will be able to kind of help you definitely determine cash flow uh, on average, so you will be able to make sure that you're understanding how long, what carrier it takes to pay you the full value of service, particularly when you have multiple providers in one location and some of them are paid based on the performance of work they do. You, I mean, you'll be paying the provider before you are fully paid for the work they do. So a waterfall report definitely helps you kind of uh, work with that and understand uh, how long and then how much has been paid properly. And with that, you'll be able to definitely have a real good view of um, how you know how long and and whom is um, still outstanding that owes you, and then um, you'll be able to track you know track those claims and know on the 44th day I should have all my revenue inside. So the very important report, very good report to have. And then the last item I have for you today is the payment variance report. I think I kind of alluded to this uh, early on. Um, most time the benefits tell you um, that the Benefits should pay at a value, and if that value is not there, then you want to know 
why is it not paying at that variance? And in that variance report is what you will be able to generate to tell you exactly that um, you know pair one you know paid at you know ten percent less than what they were supposed to pay, or vice versa. You know, if uh, sometimes they overpay and then you want to worry about when they call for a recoupment, sometimes they make those uh, overpayments uh, in error because they, they, you know, they have uh, employees who are working and sometimes they don't always, um, uh, uh, you know, adjudicate claims as, as, as they should to. And then sometimes the systems will double pay because sometimes they, um, you, you'll get a claim um, that would get reprocessed and, and you'll see those reversals and things of that nature. But you want to definitely make sure that your VARES report is showing you, uh, on average, what is being um, paid, and then is it paid properly? And if it's not paid properly, you definitely want to pursue. And by pursuing those, you're able to now close out the claim, and then they'll kind of match up to your waterfall report to make sure how long did it take you to pay, uh, or that claim to pay, uh, so you don't sit and wait for uh, or anticipate revenue that's definitely not going to come. But you also want to make sure that uh, all the reports you receive, and there's hundreds and hundreds of reports. Uh, we have a query system that can generate approximately 400 different reports uh, just on billable items. So you want to make sure if you're not using KPIs, you want to start using KPIs. And don't just take the general report of agent and look at the fact that, oh, I have 100,000 in 60 days and another 100,000 in 90 days. Find out why. Why is it in that book bucket? It should be paying. And on average, what do your, how long do it take your carriers to pay you for the work you do? And if they're not paying you, uh, then the, those are the indicators that you fight for and that you want to make sure that you have uh, some way to identify uh, what you want to pursue. Because at the end of the day, if you're not getting paid for the work you do, uh, it won't be long that you won't be able to do the work that you do because you just can't do it for free. And it's okay to get paid for what you, uh, the service you render. And it, it just the goal is to get paid for uh, what you do based on the benefits of the client. So you understand that those benefits at the beginning when you're verifying benefits, and you're understanding what the coverages are, and you use those coverages to determine how you want to design your fiscal model in your organization. So that's about a half hour of, of information on a basic level. We will always be available if you have uh, you know, follow-up questions or want to know more about the work that we do here at Medivans or just learning more about the various reports and the items that can help guide you uh, to better understand uh, where your money is, how claims are going out, and when once they go out, are they being adjudicated properly? When they get to the carrier, are they processing them timely, and they process them under the right value? And you're able to kind of collect that, and um, that's what's real good about having KPIs. Metrics are wonderful. They're, they're a good baseline to get you a uh, a perspective on uh, all the potential improvements you need to do in your organization, uh, both from the front end, the middle, and the back end. And we're happy to, uh, you know, bring this series and, and other series of talks to you guys. And I appreciate each and every one of you for being on uh, the webinar today. And uh, we look forward to uh, addressing any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bill. And let's see if we have any questions. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, you are free to raise your hand or just type in your question in the chat window. And we just want to thank everyone and thank you, Bill, for attending today's Medivance webinar series, which is hosted by Medivance Billing Service. Okay, so once you leave today's webinar, you are going to be receiving a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you would complete the survey and provide us your feedback on today's webinar. You're going to receive that survey within 48 hours and it will give you a link to review the recording of today's webinar which was the importance of KPIs in revenue cycle management. On behalf of Medivance Billing Service and our presenter William Bill McCormick, we want to thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.